talk about mind reading. Well, communication. But for the purpose of this talk, I think that it's helpful to conceptualize communication as mind reading. That is to say that we're capitalizing on the unique and incredible power of the human brain to transmit thoughts to and receive thoughts from another human brain. We mind read by rapidly interpreting numerous verbal and nonverbal signals. As I'm standing here on the stage, I'm engaged in, in a complex physical process. One which I learned as an infant from other mind readers can be used to express my thoughts, needs, desires, etc. Air from my lungs is flowing through and vibrating my vocal cords. Muscles around the larynx are contracting to modulate my pitch. My tongue and jaw are performing a complicated dance, perfected over many years to produce the speech sounds which many of you have been socialized to recognize and assign meaning to. Furthermore, my brain's output is currently tuned to a channel called English, which is likely the primary language of most people here today. But my spoken English communication isn't the only way to take thoughts from one brain to another. To start with, there are a lot of languages. 6,500, if you can believe it. And this is just spoken language. We also have an astounding diversity of sign languages. About 300 of them around the world. If you've ever studied a sign language, you'll have noticed just how naturally visual and spatial information flows in stunning 3D through carefully choreographed fingertips. Each digit acting as a vessel, again, for information to travel from one head to another. Beyond these two media, we have writing which allows us to communicate without speaking out loud, to revisit thoughts at a later point, or to send these thoughts to someone not immediately present. Something that amazes me is just by reading something like the Gettysburg Address. I can have running through my brain the same things that our president had running through his brain centuries ago as he was preparing for his famous speech. Simply, written communication allows our thoughts to transcend time and distance. Technology also facilitates communication. In just the past decades, cell phones have become a near omnipresent communication device. Online, billions of strangers every day have the opportunity to communicate, to read each other's minds via social media or other outlets. And a sizable amount of our population uses technology for AAC, alternative or augmentative communication systems. AAC could include books with pictures, flashcards, communication boards with various symbols, speech generating devices, and a number of other high and low tech options to ensure that each and every person has the ability to share their thoughts. For some people, this can now be accomplished by blinking the eyes or directing the gaze. With the proper technology, with just a fluttering of the eyelashes or a flick of the pupils, someone who may in another century have been unable to express themselves has the ability to do that. But why am I telling you all this? But frankly, I believe human communication to be so beautiful, so amazing, so magnificent, so miraculous in all of its forms. And I want you two to feel this all. The things in my brain in just seconds are traveling to all of you. Weeks, months, maybe years later, perhaps someone will watch the recording of this. And then the things that I have running through my head and hear running through all of your heads will be delivered to them across the screen. This is magic. Over millennia, languages have evolved, some gone extinct. We've assigned social meanings to various gestures. We've developed writing, technology, to catalog communication and to create accessible thought sharing for more of our population. This is all why I want to be here today. Human experience so revolves around communication. We have a very full telepathic toolkit so many means to send and receive thoughts. To review a few, speech, signs, gestures, print, braille, assistive technology, facial expressions, the internet. And yet with all of this enabling the transfer of ideas, language frequently serves to divide us. And I want to see the end of something called linguistic superiority. Linguistic superiority is the notion that one language, and I'm going to extend this concept to other communication systems, can be superior to another which is wholly false. The fact is, any one of us could have been born to a different family, in a different region, with different communities.
communicative strengths, needs, whatever, we could be using a different communication style than we currently employ. I promote the philosophy that this would make you no less of a human being, and that your thoughts would be no less valuable. Let me give you a description of where, how linguistic superiority can manifest. We're in America. In America, the majority of residents are English speakers. English speakers, like myself, living in America, are told again and again that our communication style is valid. And it is. Spoken English is one of a plethora of options for expressing thought. But also in America, we have this incredible, stunning communicative diversity. And it is when we treat other languages, dialects, and communication systems as less valid that everyone suffers. There are a number of factors that contribute to what is favored, what is given this validation by society. And these factors largely align with existing power structures. Again, here, spoken English is generally viewed as the ideal. Sign language systems and AAC are treated as inferior due to the way society conceptualizes this ability and makes assumptions based on perceived competence and intelligence. For students enrolled in special education programs, those who use traditional spoken language are far more likely to be included in a classroom with neurotypical peers than, say, a student who communicates with a speech-generating device. This is to the detriment of all students who are subsequently deprived of this opportunity to engage with a great variety of communication systems. Historically, schools for the deaf and school systems that serve the deaf have treated deaf children who use spoken language and lip read as superior to deaf students who use sign language. Those who are successful and enthusiastic in speech training are permitted to take more advanced classes. While those who prefer the use of sign language can be relegated to hours upon hours of tedious speech drills and not be permitted to take more advanced classes like math or to spend their class time learning valuable things like math, reading, and science. This is something that still happens. Also in schools, we can see a divide between students who communicate with a more standard American English dialect and children who speak a dialect known as African American Vernacular English, or Black American English. This divide ties in to existing prejudices involving race, socioeconomic status, and perceived education level. Students who speak with African American Vernacular English are afforded less positive attention in schools from teachers or other adults, are disproportionately placed into remedial classes, and are more likely to be the subject of a disciplinary action. But why? This isn't lazy English, these aren't bad kids, and this isn't some refusal or inability to learn proper English grammar. This is a dialect, which, like other dialects, is a rule-governed system. It has its own rules to production. These variations on language, on English grammar, are passed down through generations, and this is how we see a beautiful spectrum of dialectal variation. But rather than recognizing this as another manifestation of the stunning diversity of human communication, of human experience, we condemn these kids for not speaking in accordance with the standard, with the majority. We live in a country where many female politicians work to deepen their voices. Because if their pitch is perceived as too feminine, if their ideas are traveling through space at too high a frequency, we presume them incompetent. In a country where only a few weeks ago, a student was kicked off a plane and interrogated just for speaking Arabic. A country which is needlessly infuriated that we must press one for English, even though this minute inconvenience, if you can even call it that, grants use of the service to countless others. A country which discourages sign language for deaf children or heritage languages for students who speak another language at home because there is some unfounded belief that these languages will become a crutch. And then the same system turns around and demands that we all learn a second language in high school, well after our brains have passed their language acquiring primes. There's something fundamentally wrong with the way we as a society are viewing linguistic diversity. And this trend affects everyone. It's fairly clear how linguistic minorities suffer from this all-too-pervasive phenomenon of superiority. The imposed <coughs> environment
environment of isolation, degradation, and condescension are absolutely caustic. But for the majority in America, those who use spoken English, how is this group impacted? If we were to believe that our communication style is superior to another's, we're less likely to engage with them. And thus we miss out on all that their brain, their perspective has to offer. Many of us in the majority have become accustomed to having our communication needs met by society. Generally, America is designed for English speakers. And perhaps growing so used to the richness of resources available in our own language has magnified our trepidation to step outside of our communicative comfort zones. To a certain extent, this discomfort is natural. As human beings, we want to understand and to be understood. And so it is in our nature to seek out situations that satisfy us in this regard. But in challenging our mind reading abilities with conversation partners who communicate differently, we engage the brain in new and exciting ways. We take bilingualism. Studies have shown the effects of this for the brain. For bilinguals, we see improved focus on tasks, better memory and problem solving, and even a decreased or delayed rate of dementia. Bilingualism can also open doors to other cultures and increase higher ability. Learning a new language can be a stimulating challenge for us, but the time, resources, and cognitive abilities it could require make it a non-option for some. Thankfully, it's far from the only way we can strengthen and stretch our communication skills. By making a concerted effort to engage across communication barriers, differences, we force our brains to problem solve and find creative solutions to foster understanding, mind reading. We also, slowly but surely, build confidence in other communication media. All those tools that we talked about, gestures, facial expressions, writing, technology, and the rest, these all can be used in the absence of a shared communication system. If you encounter a barrier in conversation, it's incumbent on you, as one of the communicators, to try. If we think of this difference as a wall, we can't sit idly and expect the other person to climb all the way up and over to us. We also shouldn't avoid this wall entirely. Instead, what we can do is meet the other person in the middle, on top of this wall, and have our conversation there. Let me elaborate on a few ways we can do that. Say we have two conversation partners. If there's a difference in dialect, it's likely that they'll still understand each other for the most part. If there's a word or phrase that's unfamiliar, they can request clarification. If one signs and the other speaks, written communication can bridge the gap. If these two speak different languages without a shared written system, then their conversation could include gestures, drawn pictures, or maybe it's facilitated by a bilingual dictionary or even Google Translate. If one is deaf-blind, or they're blind and they speak another language, then rather than drawing out pictures with pencil and paper, we can illustrate points on a palm, maybe printing letters here, and in this way work to reconcile any communication difference. Or in any of these cases, one person can take out a smartphone and use a quick internet search to try and repair any miscommunication. The important thing is that we're working to look beyond any difference in communication style, and instead trying to look into the other person's mind. Seriously, with all of these resources available to us, there is no reason for communication differences to be so divisive. On a societal level, this requires upheaving change to the entire paradigm of communication. But on an individual level, there's a lot that we can do. We can be aware of just how awesome communication is. And in this way, we can appreciate differences when we encounter them, rather than immediately alienating a possible conversation partner. We can be patient through the process and recognize that both parties need to be engaged in trying to make communication work. When you have two styles coming together, it might take some time and some trial and error to figure out how best to have a conversation. And that's okay. Patience is important here. And we can also be open, open to new experiences, to the stunning, beautiful, incredible diversity of human communication, 
and to incorporating new words, signs, and strategies into our own communicative repertoires. Now, the counter-argument is that we should all learn spoken English for the sake of efficiency. But this mindset doesn't take into account individuals' strengths, needs, and circumstances. For an immigrant moving to America later in life, English could be very difficult to learn. For a deaf child, speech training and lip reading can be an expensive, time-consuming, and sometimes imprecise process, while a visual style of communication could work better. For some individuals, based on medical status or intellectual or developmental condition, spoken English might not be a worthwhile goal, and their time could be better spent working to develop other strategies to facilitate fluent communication. Even if we are to mandate one language spoken English, there are going to be some individuals for whom this is impossible or highly inefficient. And should we really exclude these individuals from society because they choose to practice telepathy in a different way from how we do? It's extremely important that we're valuing linguistic diversity because by insisting on one language, we contribute to the process by which languages disappear, go extinct, as their speakers over generations are almost forced to convert to only using the language of the majority. This is sad and this is scary because linguistic diversity represents millennia of history, of culture, of the influence of groups and individuals on ever-evolving communication. We walk among mind readers gifted practitioners of telepathy who, as a species, have spent their time on this planet developing millions of channels via which thoughts travel. If we want to take advantage of the vastness of thought spread out over seven billion extraordinary minds, we have to actively work to eliminate linguistic superiority. Please, challenge yourself to evaluate your own relationship with language. How has it empowered you? shaped your experiences? How might your life be if you communicated differently? And how can you expand on your abilities? Go out, learn a new word, a new phrase, start a conversation. One by one, through engaging in discussion about humankind's greatest superpower, we can work to change attitudes that divide us and move towards a more acceptable and accessible society. Thank you.